possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, it's All-Ireland semi-final weekend, or week, build-up to the weekend. Who thought we'd get here? Not too sure, but we're here. Isn't it great to say, the CRTGA podcast? And we have, as everybody expected, the semi-final matchups are Dublin v Cavan and Tipperary v Mayo. I'm only joking. It's an incredible shock. Who saw plucky little Dublin getting out of Leinster? I certainly didn't, anyway. Um, <laughs> with us today, as always, we have Rory, we have Pat Spillane, and I'd like to say Kieran Shannon is joining us as well. Is everybody well on this beautiful December morning? Very well, Mikey. Good okay. stuff. Um, it's a, look, it, it, it's, it's a, a year like no other, as we keep saying, but the, these are semi-final matchups like no other, except like the year 1920, of course, which is bizarre, even if they were played in 1922. We could go down a rabbit hole here. Um, I, I, I don't think you can really talk... Like, I saw, I think it was um, Martin Brehney in the Irish Independent said it was insulting that, to Cavan and all they've achieved this year to make them 1-100 to for this match. Uh, Pat, on the evidence that you have seen thus far, would you say that it's maybe the number is a bit dramatic and the bookies are making headlines because they know they're not going to make any money on this match, but at the same time, it's hard to give Cavan a prayer, really, is it? Um... Prob- I, I could, you know, look, I was the fella in the, the, the preview of the Dublin Meat game and, and I could give you a lot of arguments why, not that Meat would win, but that Meat would make a really good game of it against the Dubs. I genuinely thought, having watched them in the league, I thought, uh, I thought Meat could bring it to single digit figures anyway. I thought a seven or eight point loss and it would have been a good performance for Meat. And unfortunately, on the day, on the day, they didn't turn up. And I was just, you know, we're very privileged and we're very lucky to be able to, working for RTE, to get to be in the stadium, to be watching the matches up close. And that, that Saturday night was the first night that I ever really got a close-up look at the dubs in action. Got the du- a close-up look at the dubs in their pre-match warm-up, but got a close-up look at the dubs on the field. And geez, uh, Mikey, they blew me away. I, I couldn't believe their work rate, their energy, uh, their attitude. From the, from the start to the finish, they never let up. And, you know, that's the sign of a great team. And, I, I, and, and you know, they, the, they won't disrespect Kevin on Saturday night. They didn't disrespect Meat. They pushed up on Meat kickouts. They went at Meat. And, you know, the great thing about a great teams. When great teams smell a weakness or when great teams smell blood, they go for it. And Dubs that day, in the eight, in the ninth minute, in the eighth, ninth minute, they started to smell blood and they went at meat. And for the next 29 minutes, it was awesome football. They scored two nine, two ten without reply, reply. And I was just thinking, you know, you think of poor old Kerry, and I have to mention this again, but anyway, like you think of Kerry who went up to Park and Keeve to face A, a cock team who had operated in Division Three all year. Be a cock team who are rank outsiders, and they decided, oh God, save us, we must treat cock with respect, uh, we'll concede territory, we'll concede possession, and we'll let them have the ball. Oh God, save us, cock must have thought that they all their Christmases had come together, because they had time and space in the ball, they built up slowly, and eventually as the game wore on, they suddenly realised, geez, we're in a game, we have confidence, and, uh, and we have a chance, <laughs> they beat him. So, Kevin, do I think Kevin have a chance? Not really. <laughs> To be, you say, to be, uh, you say and, and I'll tell you why. Go on. Because, because for a very simple reason, and we can talk about, about structures and whatever like that, we are looking at an awesome team. I mean, I, I met some of the meat players after the game, and, and to be quite honest, they were caught for words. They were like, they were just dumbstruck because they had been hit by a blue tsunami. They were like rag dolls being thrown around in the tide and in the waves. They were helpless. And, and while... Kevin, I think, will put up a great show and will put up a good battle. Again, if they're, if they're losing by single-digit figures, I think that's a victory of sorts. Is it, though? Is it a victory for football, though, Kieran? Um, Connor Neville wrote a piece on the RT website earlier in the week which got a good reaction, and he made a fairly simple... He wrote it very well, because Connor always writes things very well, but he made a very simple argument. He said, 
most GA fans don't want Cavan to make a game of it this weekend because if Cavan make a game of it, the Dublin argument kind of gets sho- gets shoved under the mat again. Kind of what a lot of GA fans want here is for Pat said Dublin are smelling blood. They kind of want to drowned in blood by the by Chris by the time Christmas comes, and so everybody can see the scale of what is a problem. As Pat said, they're a wonderful football team. No one's nobody's disputing that. It's getting to the point now where it's a problem how good they are. And what we need here is two very, very convincing double digit wins in a semi final and a final. Yeah, well I, I, I do think that Kevin have um I think Kevin are going to get what I call the Riscommon treatment, which is, um, if, if you look at it over the last seven or eight years, Kevin and Riscommon have been very similar. I think they've played in three Division Two or Division Three finals. They, they tend to get promoted together, relegated together. This year they went different directions in Division Two, but they're very similar. And I would compare Kevin to uh, how they've won Ulster this year, to how Riscommon maybe won Ulster or won Connick last year. They beat good teams, like Riscommon had to beat Mayo in Mayo, and they had to beat Galway in Galway, the same way that Cavan this year beat top teams in Monaghan and Donegal. But then it comes to the it comes to Crow Park, it comes to the real thing, and you meet the truth. You know, and Dublin are the truth. And the you know, Pat was saying about a sign of a great team that they're probably a sign of the the greatest team. Pat was in probably the other great team. But like, I remember reading Pat tell the story about the Milltown Malby massacre. Yeah. About, um, <coughs> did you say who, who was it? Your brother who was dropped after one of the club boys <laughs> one four of them. Was it was it Mick who got dropped? Was it afterwards? Like, I, a, like what? I can't remember. You know. So yeah. Well, one of the boys I think got got one, one the four off him, and they were and they were and they were dropped. And the point, like one of somebody said to you afterwards, like, why didn't you just ease off? Why didn't you do a Ray Cummins yeah. over the bar? And you said, look who's on the bench, man. And the thing yeah. is, like, Donahue, Donahue would talk about, in, in, in the book I did with him, he would talk about the Dingle Racist Syndrome when they would be playing a Tipperary or Clare about how you're a thoroughbred racehorse and you're there in the first round of Munster. He'd compare it to a thoroughbred ho- horse, you know, at the Dingle Racist. Like, you're not up for it. Whereas your Cheltenham, the ears are pricked. You're up for it, and and you, and you perform, and and you know you'd sometimes hear about great teams that they just do enough to win for when it counts. And 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 Kerry had that. Danny, he was on those teams that might only beat a Tipperary or Clare by six or seven in Munster, but then come Crow Park. But the thing about Dublin is, it's all and it's it's because it's almost it's always Crow Park. The ears are always pricked, and as Pat said, like to them, they treat every game and every opponent. To, like yeah. we, we have to say, the only thing we've seen like it is Cody's Kilkenny in in the pomp, you know, 2002 to 2014, yeah. uh, 15. Yeah. Like they, they just are relentless, and they are going to yeah. um, they are going to respect Kevin. But yeah. I am afraid they're going to do what Riscommon happened to Riscommon, unfortunately, when they came up to Croker. Uh, you just meet another caliber of uh, opposition, and um, like you would. You would love if Kevin did. If you remember, and Kevin are a better team than that Fermanagh team of 2015. But you remember, like, Fermanagh got well beaten, but they kept going to the end, and they got a couple of goals. They quickly got a, a dodgy enough goal on Cluxton, and, and it was only an eight-point game. And, and, you know, I remember at the time, Fermanagh got criticised for going around and saluting their supporters. But when you look back on it, it was a phenomenal achievement to get within single figures of the dubs. This Cavan team are better, and they've been a breath of fresh air for the championship. Yes. Like, there's nothing more exciting than seeing a new team coming through and get, to get new characters. And you, you feel like you're getting to know this Cavan team. It's been a breath. They've, they've been brilliant now. They've made the championship. But you're just afraid yeah. that... It's going to end in blood and tears. Actually, you're right. Sorry, Kiel. I mean, I, I talked about that weekend, actually. I was writing about it last weekend. and I, I thought I'd never again experience emotions on GA Field that I experienced as a player. But two weeks ago, I experienced those emotions. First of all, on the Saturday night in Crow Park for the, for the Bloody Sunday celebrations, which was so well done, so poignant, so emotive. And it, it was something that... It was an experience that I couldn't describe. It was surreal, and, but it was so special to be there. But Sunday, two provincial finals, the victories for the underdogs of Tipperary and Cavan were just 
Well, just brilliant, because we all dare to dream and we always hope that David will slay Goliath. And they did on that day. And, and it was just because I came from a small club, Temple No, where we lost far more games than we ever won. But we kept going. We ploughed on every year and every year. Uh, we went two years without winning a game. But we stuck at it and we got... And it, it comes in cycles. But you know what I liked about Kevin? It was brilliant to see long overdue success. But what I loved about the players and the management after the game was when they spoke. They were so articulate, so intelligent. There was no shouting from the rooftops and telling their critics, we proved you wrong. They were just so humble in victory. I just loved it. I, I loved everything about it. The celebrations just, just But, but the way both teams went about it too, Pat. Yes. Like, I mean, let's say there were two very good games. Like, like it was, and look, it, it looks foolish. And I, I look foolish for some of the things I wrote after Cork beat Kerry because I just thought it was the start of something with Cork. And I still think... <laughs> you but, think but anyway, that's another thing. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Rory, Rory. But the point, the point was it, was, it was a great contest and it was a great climax, but it wasn't a great game, right? As a game to watch. Those two games were great to watch. Like, yeah, don't worry. The, the Munster final and the Ulster final. And you have to give it to Graham. Because, like... That's twice now. You can't, you're like, it's one thing to ambush Monaghan one year. To do it two years in a row, I mean, that, that's two years in a row they've done it. Mm -hmm. um, and to go at Donegal, no, I do think, I mean, I, I, apart from Daryl Shea touching on it, there has been very little. Donegal have got off relatively lightly, but I, I have to say, you know, that's three years in a row now. Yeah. It looked like Donegal were the dominant team in Ulster and they still have found a way not to get to an All-Ireland semi-final. Like if that, if, if that was a team like a Mayo, we'd be slaughtering them. And I know you can talk about the core of the team still being relatively young, but, you know, McGee, Murphy at the age profile, this was a year for them to do. And, 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 and going back to what you're talking about, Mikey, I wouldn't... The Dublin argument, which we'll come to know probably, but there was that conflicting thing and where you just had to park it and go no on today we'd love to see Cavan win rather than being the whole debate being dominated by Dublin because there was that suspicion that Donegal would at least it's, Dublin it's a, again. It's a hopeless and, uh, hope though Kieran, isn't it like you know come on we can all we can we can talk about them giving them a good game and everything but uh, and let's all who who uh, sorry you can you can hope you can hope that Cavan will give them a good game and no and but we, we were hoping that them. we were expecting that Do that Donegal would and hmm. so, so it was great just to have Kevin win that day. But the, and and so therefore it's it is what it is, and it's been ultimately I think great for the this yeah. championship. Rory, Dave, but, um, oh yeah, go on. Sorry, but ju but, ju but just that this is where I think we could end up with a situation for you know all those people who are saying the do or die. It's been great. We should go back to it. I think there's a chance that we will look back on it where, where you would you'd want to qualify so that we ended up with. Semi finalists and finalists who would who would test it. <laughs> yeah, Could Rory that's, explain that's, what happened Cork in the Munster final while we're here? <laughs> I know we are <laughs> right now. So we can start yes, that was usual. Do you, the, the same, I'll tell you what happened, Pat. The same thing that's been happening in Cork football for probably 100 years one step forward, two steps back. It's the usual. Sorry, sorry, Mikey. We, we've spent a lot of time on that. We can't, we've just finished a round of counseling. Don't start it again, Pat. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rory, uh, we, we, did a, <laughs> we did a whole podcast on Dublin last week and one thing Kevin McStay wouldn't let up on he said I know it's not the big dramatic thing that everybody wants but he says venue equality in Leinster will make a huge yeah. difference away in a home and away I don't think too many people are making an argument that an All-Ireland football semi-final should be played anywhere but Crow Park but if you want to talk about Levin the field and look at the fields that Kevin played on in Ulster um, it's going to Crow Park's going to be very different and you can, you can, I'm not trying to insult Kevin here. They won, they won some winter football and now they're going to come down and play their first game of, you could almost call it summer football, whatever way the pitch is, whatever way the weather is, that pitch is going to be immaculate. But you can't I, I tell you this, I, I walked the pitch in Crow Park on the, the, day, the night of the Lynx to final. Uh, uh, look, it's, it's one of the biggest pitches in Ireland. It's a footballer's pitch. It's a, there's no hiding place in it. It's a pitch for athletes, for pace, for athleticism, for stamina. Uh, but the one thing amazed me about the pitch, it was, it reminded me of playing in Fitzgerald Stadium in a hot day in July. The surface was, was that, it was summer surface. It yeah. was top of the ground, bouncing off it, football. And that, 
look, that is not a level. That means the best team, the best athletes, the best players will win. But can, just, can I just quickly go back to, because it's very easy to dismiss Cavan and whatever like that, and, and we, get, we get bogged down in how good Dublin are and the dominance of Dublin is ruining and we need to get them out of Crow Park. But, but what I like about Cavan and Tipperary, like as Kieran alluded to, there was no negative tactics, there was no parking the bus. They were positive in their approach. They had well, belief in them. the bus now. Tip did park the bus now, Pat. In fairness now, Tip did park the bus. Let's be honest about that. Yeah, but that's the way they play, and there's nothing look, that's that's their prerogative. But what I want to say, it's Kevin really I want to just allude to here. And I mean we can talk about tactics and we can talk about skill and we can talk about processes and strength and condition and athleticism. But the character shown by Kevin in this year's yeah. championship has been just unbelievable. Because think about it, they played six weeks in a row. The first two weeks they were awful against Kildare. Yeah. And, and against a weakened Roscommon team that had half a team and they were relegated and then they come into four matches and they win the next four matches and think of how they did it 10 minutes to go they're six points down against Monaghan 10 minutes to go they're six points down and didn't ever look like winning and they, and they got it an extra time uh, against Antrim they were down at half time against Antrim against Down they were Ten points. Eight points oh, down. There were yeah. ten points down in the middle ten. of the first half, and a half an hour later, they were level. They were down against Donegal. That character is a massive. And just think also, bad enough that they were losing in all those games and they had to come from behind. Jesus, they did it the hard way. Yeah. Against Antrim. Three black hats. Three black hats. That's <laughs> thirty minutes with fourteen men against Down. They had two black cards. That's that, that, twenty that, that, minutes with forty, and against Donegal another, the same. Another so two. character never. Do you know what? Mm. All you ask as a manager is that the team give you everything. That they but show character, they show. Could I ask you this? Could I ask you all this? That's all fine. Pulling off those spirited comebacks and digging out incredible victories <laughs> on, as we said, shite pitches in the Pistons of rain. If you gave this Dublin team the, a black card or two black card oh, geez. or a ten point or, or a ten card point for fifteen minutes, minutes. Yeah. what's probably going, what what will happen then? Well, I'd say one of the things they've talked about is if we don't give away a black card. That's it. Um, so you know that that would be like they, they'll have even though they've won there'll be you know things that they'll be looking to improve on. Yeah. Um, like I, I think, and it's important the point that we don't pigeonize Kevin because that yeah. was, look, first of all, like there hadn't been, Armagh in 2005 won the first preliminary Ulster title in, in over 50 years. And then Donegal did it in 2011 and 2012 with McGuinness. And um, like, so they're only the fourth team of the last 65 years to win it. And okay, outside of playing Tyrone, who they didn't get to meet, they, they, like they went through Monaghan and Donegal. Like, so it is like, they are a legit, you'd have to say, top eight team. Like, you know, but the only thing is they're they're unfortunately they're playing the top one and <laughs> um that, that is that is what's frightening. And and going back to like they have had some experience from those league finals of playing in Croker and they were there in twenty thirteen in a quarter final against Kerry, but a lot of those boys haven't like it, it you are just that can't be said enough. Like I think this is where being an All Ireland semi final, it is the place. But I do think you mentioned the term you had. Was it what, what was it? Venue uh, equality. Venue equality. I do think that one thing that hasn't been looked at enough. And um, there's been talk about what you do with the Leinster Championship. The big, the big switch in Dublin of all the things that they've had was when they and you know P Pat went back to how he gave me the chance. That would have been part of it was based on the league game when the teams came back. And that game was in Parnell Park. That was Dublin's first game in Parnell Park since 2010. When the Dubs moved in to Crow Park in 2011 with the spring series and it was double bills with the hurlers at the start. I, I think that advantage is unbelievable because you've got, like whatever you yes, say, like, because, like that's what is new because people would say, oh, well, look, no one was given out when Dublin were, when they were losing in quarterfinals, all Ireland quarterfinals and semifinals under the, let's say the pillar era, but they were playing Leinster Championship games at home. But the difference was they were only playing Leinster Championship games in Crow Park. They weren't playing 
um, National League games in Crow Park unless they got to league semi-finals, which they didn't do in the noughties. So like the point is, is that they were, I, I think that has been, it, the difference is that the Kieran Whelan would lose in August and he wouldn't see Crow Park again till May or June. Whereas a generation of Dublin player now, John Small, Conor Callaghan know nothing else but playing in Crow Park. And the difference is, it's like... Get, it's a home we're, venue. We're, <laughs> what? It's a home venue. Kevin. It is a home venue. And that, that, that is what is happening. And I, I, do think, and I do think it is something that has to be looked at. And because Dublin, we can go through each one on its own merits about the funding because ultimately that's where the population is. The games development officers are there for the population. It's not for even the registered players. We can go through it all. But Dublin, what we have to say is Dublin can't have it everywhere. They can't have it everywhere. And one of the things, like it has to be asked, and, and one thing as a journalist, I haven't asserted this, what is the rate for Dublin to host it or to, for, to, get, to hire out Crow Park for um, a National League game? What is, what, how much is it? Because it's obviously worth it for them. And, and you know, like, the, the, like the, because, and I, I wonder, like, are Crow Park giving them a pretty discount rate because it helps the National League in February. You're covering National League games now, Rory, and it looks great in February and Kerry and Dublin yeah. playing in February and the floodlits are on and Joanne and Pat are there and the backdrop is Crow Park. And we've been watching um, we've been watching, you know, Premiership or Rugby in Viva earlier in the day and we go to Crow Park. But that has actually what the league has elevated by 20% has reduced the competitiveness of the championship by 20% because I go, the example I would give is John Small, Paddy Small, all these Dublin players. It's like the fridge in your kitchen or, you, you, you know, trying to get the milk in your own kitchen. You might have two fridges, but you know exactly where to go. You know, even a Mayo who know Crow Park so well, they have to check again which one of the two fridges is the milk in. The, the boys know exactly where the fridge is. They have everything. And it is just, I, I, when I saw Mark O'Shea just put it so well at the weekend, he says, I no longer think of it as a national stadium. You the know, only thing about it, Kieran, I'll tell you this, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you played the dubs tomorrow, if you, if you, if you, if you took them out of Crow Park. No, they'd likely them, win as well. They'd like and played them on, in a swamp, played yep. them in a hay meadow, played them on Port Barnett Beach, if you decided no, true, Dublin, true. you have to play against the wind in both halves. Uh, if you have, you have to play uphill all the time, God save us. They gave us an extra man in last year's all Ireland and we couldn't beat them. So look. <laughs> no, that, it, is, true. It, that it, is true. It doesn't matter where the Dubs play. No. What, the one thing about the Dubs, it, would it, doesn't the about tactics. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about tactics. It doesn't matter about game plan. It doesn't matter about pitches. It doesn't matter about conditions. Because what they have is game intelligence. These boys can adapt to any condition. They're reading the adapt situation. They're just brilliant. Game but they don't need to so adapt. That's the problem. They don't need to. So it wouldn't no, matter. <laughs> Look, but can I make, but, but, but Pat, Pat, I just make one point on it, right? I think, like, if you look back to the Jim Gavin era when Jim Gavin first started playing football for Dublin, like, Jim, uh, the Dublin team back in the early 90s, they were in a couple of All-Ireland finals. They lost one against Down and they lost one against Donegal. And then they finally won their All-Ireland against Tyrone in 95. Now, there's a perception, rightly or wrongly, that's, flow, that's, that's thrown out there. That, and I think maybe something that Jim Gavin picked up on, certainly given his media dealings over his own tenure for the last five or six years, in that hype cost Dublin All-Irelands back in the 90s. That it was hype that actually um, tripped them up uh, uh, towards the back end of some big championship matches. And it was something that I think he made a huge point of guarding against when he went in and became manager himself. And he went out of his way with all sorts of tricks of the trade, you know, in terms of his, what he would say to us post-match, you know, coming out after we've come off the air to make sure the interview is watered down. You know, the, you know, lads being trained within an inch of their lives not to say anything. That's all fine. So hype was the big danger. What I would actually argue is, here's the, big, the bigger danger now is apathy. And apathy is starting to grow and it's starting to fester in a massive way. Not just Where? outside. 
Everywhere, I would say, Karen. No, but outside, uh, not, not within their own camp, though. No, 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 no. no. I'm talking yeah. about the actual. I'm talking about supporters. I'm even talking about the Dublin supporters themselves. I'm, I'm starting to detect an awful lot of people. There's a sense of hopelessness and an almost a sense of so why should we? You know, what's the point? What, what is actually the point of even watching or turning up to watch? Now we can't do that obviously on Saturday because the the whole thing is a foregone conclusion. And I think that's a very dangerous mindset to start seeping in. And if that's there, that has to be a worry for the GAA at national level. Would you not think? I think you could argue that the you'd have to say and you'll see them on, on Monday, Roy, the viewing figures for Sunday's match, you would imagine, are going to be higher than the viewing figures for Saturday's matches, because I think Which would the, be Sunday, the Sunday match is the, yeah. is the more but, enticing. Well, but, yeah, well, look, I mean, look, the proof is in, was it like, I know it was a Saturday game, but like in 2018, Galway, who, you know, got to the league final, um, that all Ireland semi-final had only 53,000, right? 50, Whereas... Whereas, you know, like the equivalent of back in the Kieran Whelan era, as we'd say, you know, they were playing in front of 80,000 against Wexford in the Leicester semi final. So there, there, there is that. There is that. The only thing is, is virtually every year there has been a test. 2018 itself was probably the only year where they weren't. This year, though, there is very likely that, um, well, we're probably going to come to the other semi final in a bit. It's it's not a like what you'd love to see Cavan do. Like Pat mentioned, that he thought Meath might do. Do you remember Kildare? Was it in 2017? They gave the Dubs a good rattle. Dean Rock at the Black Heart, Brogan mm. came on, kicked five or six points. Um, it ended up being it only ended up only ended up being an eight point game. You'd love to see Cavan. Um, go down showing why they were Ulster champions. They're not going to be All-Ireland finalists, but you'd love to sh for them to do that. But I just, my fear is that it'll end up, as I said, a risk job. Break it down into four uh, quarters. I don't know, Rory, I'd like to disagree break it, with break you. Break it down. Bit, uh, to, and, you know, to my mind, can I just say, mind they, they need to break it down into four quarters. Get to the water yes. break, try and keep it to about four or five points. Get to half time. If it's like yeah. less than six or seven, you're doing well. Then yes. you, you, you basically, you know, break it down into nice. And, yeah. and I think, Fairness, I think Mickey Graham will have a plan. I mean, the guy is a very shrewd operator, and he's you know he's a smart fella. He'll get his matchups right. But I think that's yeah. Sorry, Look, you, 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 you go back to Mickey. You go back to Mickey's club career, and you say, and you say little Mullinata playing against the population and the resources of Kilmacud, which is the population the, the size of the county of Longford, and yet Mullinata win. Uh, but can I just say, get back to something? And, and, and I do get, you know, uh, uh, Cavan would put up a better performance than, than Meath. They won't win it, but I think they can be competitive for, for, a, they can be competitive for a reasonable spell. But this thing about apathy, and it would be very easy for me to jump on my high horse as a Kerry fella and yeah. say, I affect the dubs and they're destroying football and whatever like that. But you, and it's one sided games and I hate this. But I'm a sports fanatic. I'm a sports, I'm passionate about sport. I love all sports. But, but I stand back and sit back. And I, if there's a, a player dominating, whether it was Tiger in golf, or whether it was Federer in tennis, or whether it was the All Blacks in, in, in rugby, or whether it was Cross McGlynn in, in Amaha football, I sit back and I just have to say, God, we have to admire what we're watching here. We're I, I watching. think everybody does. I do. But I, think, I, I, but I think too often, the first thing, Dubs win by 25 points. And the first thing we're saying is, the game is a bore. We need to split up the Dubs. The provincial championship in Linster is a joke. Boom, boom, boom. Instead of first of all saying, let's admire what we're watching. I, we're, well, are people, are people I don't think we're doing it enough. Are people, but are people not worn out at this stage from throwing bouquets at them, Pat? In all fairness, you know. But come here, you, you can never stop throwing bouquets at quality. You should never. The day you stop throwing bouquets at something beautiful is the day. No one will throw if they're not watching, though, Pat. Well, the only thing is going back to where I think you were going there with that, um, Pat and Rory is. It sounded like there you're talking about the apathy, or yeah. it sounded like they're just coming, like you know the old what we used to say about Kerry supporters, I would just wait for the final. For final. You know, like that, that, that's where it's gone. But like, we have had that before, you could argue. Um, and kill Kenny Hurland fans too. Yeah, yeah well, look, this, this, this one will rage on. Um, just think that is a... Look, with Kevin, the one thing you just said it, and what you would love, it's been said, you'd, lo you'd love if they tested 
Dublin in a way. Like I remember when I was talking about. I remember when they played Kerry in 03, um Gooch, Mike Frank were in their pomp, but then at the end, Roscommon let go and they got three goals. And it was from that that Mickey Hart calculated that right. Um, we'll just look at shutting down them more than than than, than um, scoring against them. But the point was that there was a vulnerability about Kerry that day. You would love if a team, let's say, no more than what Fermanagh did that time, where they got two goals. Like you take the goal that Donny or the Cavan got against Donny Gall. You know, where, you, like, and I think that's one that you mentioned, they'll go in water breaks. Like, if Kevin have to look to get a goal in the first quarter, put, you know, what you'd love to do is they bloody their nose. You know, they might win, whatever, but you'd love to see them, you know, bloody their nose, go for it at the start. And because, like it's been said, I don't know, Pat, like that full back line with Dublin height-wise, I don't know, it, 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 or... or are, is, can, is the aerial threat is it too crude or is it a, is it a, a possibility to go with but can I just on the Dublin thing and just to park it and I'm going to give my top ones worth uh, and we're not going to solve Dublin's dominance now and what uh, we tried last week we didn't fix it then but can I, I I'll give you I'll go back to two simple things that need to be done yes I will agree with you what Kevin McSee is alluding to. Yes, we need to get the dubs out of Crow Park. Even outside of levelling the pain pit, just what the dubs coming to Longford or coming to Ockram or coming for matches can do for the GA in that county. So let's get the dubs out of Crow Park is number one. And number two, we need to resource the counties far more equitable than we are doing. And, and yes, you can point to the fact that Dublin have the bigger population, but Dublin have the population, have the resources to generate money. We need to plough more money into games coaching in the other counties. That's number two. And if I have a radical suggestion, it, a radical suggestion to equalise. Look, the bottom line is, I suppose, so communism and socialism fails, really. It, you know, in theory, everyone being equal, it doesn't work. There's, the strong get stronger and the weak get weaker. And it's the same. Sport imitates life. But if you want to try to equal, and, and, and Kieran uh, is quite familiar with this, with American sport and with basketball, maybe there is a case, I'm, t I'm talking wildly, maybe there is a case for a draft system in the G. So, for example, at the start of a championship season, each county selects their panel of, say, 40 players, right, 40 players. And outside of the 40 players, then, an allowance is given to certain designated weak counties to choose from outside the 40 players that aren't on a Dublin panel, that aren't on a Mayo panel, that aren't on a Kerry panel. And you could, there's a lot of brilliant footballers in Dublin, in Kerry, that aren't getting uh, county football, that would be very good. A, 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 bit, a bit of that has gone on. Like, I'm hearing Clare, and Clare, Clare are one of those counties, actually, that would feel privately that they left something behind this year because we're about to go into tip you know with Clark and Kerry on the motorcycle but Clare have been very competitive over the last seven yeah. years in respect but a, a big part of because um, there are rules that allow that Pat and he, a, a, yes. in terms of Clare getting momentum the likes of Shane McGrath and Pat Burke coming down to get the Clare project up and running was huge you know so there are players who have roots like uh, Owen Collins from Mayo wasn't on their panel. Owen Collins, like, w w has been a panelist for the last five or six years, a cousin of Podge. Like, I mean, the point is, is that there are, some, there are actually some flexibility. I don't know if we go all that way. No, but a formal uh, to you know yeah. just to equ equate the Dublin. It, it is another issue. Just that um, it, it, that's another debate. But look, just for, for to wrap up on Sunday, I, I would love just that if Kevin just. Uh, you know that they, like it would be something like even have Dublin conceded a goal in this year's championship yet in the three games no, uh, no. or since yeah. the league has resumed no like that, that that there's something in it that the likes of Dublin or or sorry whoever wins the Tip Mayo semi final can take something from that there yeah. was a chink that they saw that he that the champion was cut and that there's something in it and and you that's what you want Kevin to give it a cut which well, you, you think see, they will you they can will. imagine the likes of. Like, because there is a, there is the element that we will leave it now. But there is the element that the Leinster teams are beaten before they go out because they've been through this for a decade, fifteen years, whatever. But like, there is a, there's a lovely there's a lovely like prospect of the likes of like Kieran Brady and Thomas Gallagher who are play like men possessed and the rest of them. But they're the two that stand yes, out. Yes, there's there's a, there's a beautiful wildness. About yeah, there's a, like if they the might be something, something they haven't seen in at least twelve months, you know, like or more. Sorry, because like we're in this November. That, that
that's their only chance. But that might make it interesting for 10, 15 minutes. I don't see it, but I do think they could at least... The, the Dubs will know they've been in a game. I think that's what we can hope for, if nothing else. Is that fair? Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Same Jude, so... Uh, all right. Look, we'll go on to the other match, which I think we're, we're fair to say a little bit more even. Like, Mayo, again, will be favourites, but you'd be, you'd be mad to count against anything happening bar a Dublin win in this championship. Um, Kieran, you, you, you'd know these Mayo players pretty well, or at least, yeah, you would know a lot of them. But there's, there's a lot of change. I saw somebody on Twitter yesterday, it was an interesting, they've kind of done a, a championship appearance analysis on the, um, on the Mayo team, apologies to the person, I can't remember who they were. And it, it was interesting that Mayo, they've introduced a lot of new players, but it's one per line. Like the full back line has like a championship, like new boy, so does the half back line, so does midfield, half four. So they've they've blended it quite well. So a tough Connacht final one point win. Like it's not fair to call them that green anymore. Like they they've got a fair bit of experience at this stage and it's it, it doesn't like mix in the Yeah, well you gotta give it to Horn in that um last year and this year he has sprinkled up the team and hasn't been one big squeeze. Now, they ended up last year with a lot of the veterans who aren't now in the playing rotation. I, I know Keith Higgins came on in the last 10 minutes and, and it was, you know, signs of rust were there with him. He wasn't as sharp as he'd normally be. Um, but he has taken it to an extreme that you wouldn't have expected. Um, so I think that, in a way, is this year a free shot for Mayo? Like... It, they just are in transition. You can be... No, look, Dublin are in transition too. I mean, I'm sorry to bring it back to that, but like I was actually just going through their team and how different it is to the 2016 team. And it's oh, yeah. crazy. So you can do transition and be still competitive stroke win. And that is what Mayo have done. And they have they have done it... They've managed it very well. Um, but in that, if I was tip, I, there's there's not as much to be fearful of as there might have been, even when Mayo were stuttering a bit in 2016 when they met in the semi-final. Um, that Mayo team uh, of that had a lot of players in their prime, proven mm-hmm. proven prime players. Um, like That was one thing that struck you within a few minutes of watching the Cork game was, OK, Cork had won Division 3 and beaten Kerry. Tip hadn't got out of Division 3 and just scraped past Limerick, a Division 4 team. But... Within a few minutes, you, it made you realise, wait, Tipperary are the team with the more recognisable, proven players here. Absolutely. A lot more experience. And, and, and that's why I think people are giving Tip a right crack of this, because, they're, like, you have a situation, like, the, I don't think Mayo would have the same aura that they would have had um, in previous years for a team like a Tip. So Tip are going to um, approach this, like, feeling we have the better midfield um, we have um, if Tip break it down like you have a situation which is unusual which is the probably strongest looking Mayo line is looking like their full forward line which is something you wouldn't have said before um, but yet Tip would feel they have a stronger full forward line and that the, um, so I, I still would give the edge to Mayo because I do think like I, I, I mean, I love McLaughlin, Owen McLaughlin on the wing there. I just think he's, he's, he's like um, whether he's like Lee Paddy Durkin is Lee Keegan reincarnated in the half back line. But I, I do think he, he's bringing that sort of freshness that, that initial wave, you know, when Mayo broke through and just raw speed. That, that half forward line of Boyle yeah. Vaughan in his prime, like McLaughlin brings a bit of that and um. So I just do think that, yeah, like th- th- that's still a strong backline. Uh, but you know what? Yeah, I, I, like you, you look around like midfield and like there'll be a lot of talk, where's Aidan O'Shea? Well, Aidan O'Shea have to go out there because of just the physicality that Mayo, um, like we saw what Reardon, Maher, uh, O'Brien did against Cork and like Tip will definitely target that. Yeah. Um, Pat, it's... It, it's this Tipperary team are like they're very impressive while being like as as, as Kieran alluded to there being deeply deeply unimpressive against Limerick um, 
you know, we're now all very impressed with him after 70 minutes. And, you know, that doesn't, one swallow doesn't a summer make. But there's no getting away from the quality of footballers in this Tipperary team. And that you talk about Sweeney and Quinlevin, but like their goalkeeper has been one of the top goalkeepers in football for since about 2015, 2016. Likes of Bill Maher. Um, yeah. Feel that Kieran has mentioned. There is strength through that team. They're a Division Three team, but there is there are accomplished footballers in every line of the field. You're right. As Kieran alluded to, first of all, they have experience. These boys have won all out minor medals. They've been all out in the 21 final. So uh, there's plenty of experience. There's probably more experience in this Tipperary team than there is in Mayo. And certainly five years ago, they went to play Mayo in the semi final. And they would have been sort of first time in so long, and they would have been inexperienced, and they would have been in awe. These lads aren't afraid of Mayo. They've had to, so they'll come in confident. Yeah, great goalkeeper. Half back line, outstanding. A really good half back line. Bill Maher, Kevin Fahey, and who did it? Kylie. Robbie Kylie. Robbie Kylie. Mm-hmm. Centre field is a they have the advantage in midfield because in terms of primary ball winners, O'Brien, O'Reardon, and Casey, even if he comes out, they're better primary ball winners than Ruan and Loftus. Uh, Loftus is not a traditional midfielder. Ruan probably is. So, and then you have the two boys up front. Now, Quinn Levin had, had a poor Munster championship up to then. He'd only scored a pint in the two. He, he didn't score against Clare. He, got, he scored a pint against Limerick. And he was very good in the Munster final. Uh, um, Sweeney is brilliant. Sweeney is an outstanding forward and nailed on uh, to be an all-star already. Uh, do I have a, a, a problem? 40% of Tipperary scores come from, in this cha- year's championship come from Conor Sweeney. That's a danger. Mm. But, but yes, do I give them a chance? You like it? Of course I do. Uh, there's a good management. There's a good manager, good management team around them. Like I said, good experience, great character because... I looked. I watched that game against Limerick. They were atrocious. They were absolutely atrocious. In the first half performance was as bad. If you told me at half time in the Gaelic grounds that this Tipperary team will be in the All Ireland semi final, they were seven points down against a, a Division Four team in Limerick. But in fairness, they showed, we talk about character. We talked about the character of the Cavan team. They came out after half time and they scored one six without supply. Okay, they stumbled over the line, but their best performance was in the Munster final. Now. The thing about the Munster final, though, you have to realise it was a special occasion because you had all the emotion around bloody Sunday celebrations. You had the wearing of the Grange Mock Club jerseys, the green and white. Do you know, if ever a, an occasion was set up for an upset and for a big performance, this was it. Can they replicate that? I'm not too sure. But, you know, getting back to Mayo, and again, like we said, the Tipperary have more experience than Mayo. Like for the last number of years, at this stage of the competition, you'd be... Uh, doing analysis after a Mayo defeat and it would be the same old story you'd say ah, same old same old same players too much mileage in their legs going to the well once too often but this is a different Mayo team this is a fresh Mayo team and I was just looking at the statistics of the team that, of the 21 players that played in last year's semi-final against Dublin at most only 9 of that 21 will be available and so will be playing on Sunday. Only nine. That's some turnover. Mm-hmm. And you must remember last year's semi-final. In last year's semi-final, they had played seven matches in eight weeks. Yeah. And to be perfectly honest, in the second half, first half they were good. Second half they were beaten by 10 points in the end that collapsed. So I like, do you know what I like about Mayo uh, this year? I liked it about Donegal, but they got caught in the hop. But we look at, the hurling last week. And there was a great article done, I don't know who it was by, but they were talking about the physique of the modern day hurler. And you look at the physique of the Limerick hurlers and the physique of the Galway hurlers. I mean, it's unbelievable. What was it? 10 of the starting 30 last week in Galway and Limerick were over six foot two. So mm. you look at the Dublin and you say, well, what are one of the things I'm looking for? And one of the things Gavin always looked for, what's the prototype? What's the template for a modern day top class inter-county footballer? And the template is, a six foot one, six foot two athlete, middle distance runner, big engine, long, long striding, great pace. And I look at Mayo, and James Horton did something very good when he took over at Mayo at this time. He decided to write to every club in the county and said, Right, lads, if you have a fellow who you think has potential to be a county player, send him in and we're going to hold trials. And they send in all possible players. And he, he had the template in mind. He was looking for this. And he found, he's after finding jewels. He found Owen McLaughlin, Oshie Mullen, you know, Tommy Conroy. Oh, 
So he has the template to match the dubs in terms of athleticism, physicality, and pace, because they're hard running. Their work rate is, is, is so mm. Dublin-like. So this is a fresh Mayo team. This is a new Mayo team. Uh, transition, I don't know, because, I mean, is there much more left in, say, Aidan O'Shea, Killian O'Connor? And again... But, well, well like, there are. I mean, they've been reborn, yeah, I think. You yeah. know, like, Killian is playing his best football in three to yeah. four years. So you've taken the yoke off them to an extent. There's no longer the same level of responsibility placed on them. They have, there's more scores around the field. A, O'Shea can probably spend a little bit more of his time in one position, even though he does seem to like to move. No, but with, with, with O'Connor in particular, Kieran, he's not expected to do a Connor Sweeney job now. He's not expected to do that level of scoring because they've brought more scores into the team. Is that fair? Is that a bit uh, Yeah, Yeah, well... Like he he's still like he's scoring from play better than he has in in three or four years. So he he and he's still the the primary free taker. But uh, like the big thing is that he like it's been said, but like of all the teams and players that benefit from lockdown, Mayo and particularly Killian from just all the knocks. It was always a squeeze for him trying to get back at the end of the league for the first round in May and. Whereas he was able to give the body a break for those few months. And like there is a zip to him that hasn't been there in, in, in four or five years. Like he's still, lads, he's still only 28. Like, yeah, good like, kid. Yeah. Killian O'Connor, genius, brilliant footballer. But too often I look at Killian O'Connor and I see him rattling 112 against Leitrim. And then the big day, the big day when it really counts, the clutch kick, the clutch free. Oh, wait, wait a second. Pat, 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 no, that's, I, I think, unfortunately, no. he'll find it hard to shake off one or two it's of those like late yeah. frees. But he actually, along yeah. with Dean Rock, has been the best clutch player, actually. Yeah. Like, if you take the 2015 All-Ireland semi-final, his, he, he scored more goals in Crow Park than anybody else except was it this, was outside it of Dublin over the last 15 years. Was it the 16, I mean, was it the 16 final or the replay? Yeah, where yeah the draw game. game. It was unbelievable. And, 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 five metres yeah. to level the game. And it was an, an unbelievable kick. It was the best was clutch play final. I've ever seen yeah. from someone. But, and, and, and Dublin were rattled. Like Bastic picked the ball up off the ground, but the referee didn't call it for the free in. And we wouldn't be having this. I, I just and it went to a replay think, and he missed, he missed the free at the end that they did. Yeah. Extra time, but like, I, like I mean, I his goals. Sometimes, goal score... though, Karen, the biggest, the bigger, bigger problem for me at times, and I don't, maybe I'm wrong now. I don't know, but I think the service going into him hasn't actually always helped his You're... game to a large extent. Like, he's not the quickest. Let's be honest, right? He, he does lack a yard or two of pace, and sometimes I find that the ball, when the ball, like Mayo, obviously like to run the ball quite a lot. They have yeah. a lot of athleticism yeah. in their yeah. team. So it's going to be a reasonably slow build-up, which definitely doesn't help a lad who might not necessarily have the most, have the quickest legs in terms of getting out in front, where you will want it early if you want to get that turn on, get your shot off. So I don't know. I think the service sometimes, I mean... Actually, it's a fair point, because, because, sorry, uh, because you're right. I mean, I look at, was as you said, Kieran, that the strongest, or who somebody said, that the, you felt the strongest line in the Mayo team was the full forward line. Right, let's park that. I think... If, if I'm looking for a weak link in the Tipperary side, I would say it's their full back line. Right. The only problem I see with Mayo, I'm not too sure whether, and you're right, whether they utilise the full forward line enough. Because I saw in the first half against Galway, they lost shape. Killian drifted out and Aiden came to midfield. So there was no outlet ball because their forward performance that day against, against Galway was, was quite poor. Particularly you go in the second half Look at the stats from the second half of Mayo's performance against Galway. For the last 34 minutes of that kind of final, they got three pints, one pint from play. And I think it's, a, it's the million dollar question. What be, how best do you use eight no shit? I still believe if they want to trouble dubs or if they want to beat, more importantly, the first hurdle, if they want to beat Tipperary, I still think eight no shit has to be at full forward for the majority of the game. Mm. You'll find it a struggle on Sunday, though. I think Tipperary put so many put so much numbers in behind the ball. Mm. I think that they'll probably have no choice but to drift him in and out. Yes, Rory, but 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 sorry, Rory, and I know because I know I'm doing a piece on this on Sunday about Tipperary's defence. Tipperary's defence worked very well against Cork because Cork don't have a target, didn't have a target man, didn't have an outlet ball in the full forward line. Cork are a running team. 
they didn't have a target man. But Mayo have the potential to have a target man. They have an outlet ball if they place uh, Aidan O'Shea at the square. So they can, if they can kick the ball, they can kick the ball quickly over that, that, far, that, that wall at the 45-metre line. We have to finish up now in a minute. I just wanted to ask Kieran. it's something that I think uh, was touched on by Pat a few minutes ago about the emotion of the Munster final, Bloody Sunday, the Grange Mockler jerseys. Um, from your experience, is, how difficult is it to either replicate that or to find you know, the other motivation? You know, it's an All-Ireland semi-final, but Tipperary, the players admitted themselves they were riding on a wave of emotion that weekend. So that meant that... But they, they managed it very well. It's how, it's how you manage it. Like, that could have completely backfired and they were beaten by 12 points. They managed it very well. And I think the fact... No, look, it wouldn't have been a huge turnaround before, but under the current situation, two weeks is actually a considerable break. And the fact they've had that two weeks, like, I think they will have packed it. Because, look, they are looking at it. Yeah, Remind me, of said Fermanagh in 2004, they came up against... We have a chance. Mayo team. Like... I, I think they're absolutely like what because ultimately if you get to an All Ireland, that supersedes even winning a provincial title. I know it's the only way this year you could get. Yeah. But let's say I would say in two thousand and four, Fermanagh had a bigger profile within two thousand and four than Westmead had for winning Leinster because Fermanagh won a game in Crow Park. Like to me, Tip have a golden chance and they know this. I mean, whatever about a lifetime opportunity to win a Munster Championship, this is a lifetime opportunity to get to an All Ireland final. So like I think yeah. and I, I, I think between the likes of Power, Paddy Christie, yeah, like, uh, Charlie McGeever. I, I don't think the occasion is going to get to them. No, okay. and, and 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 it's just going to be whether they're the better team. I would. Pat made the point. I do think their median experience level is higher than Mayo. But look, you're you're, you're talking about people like Keegan. I, like to me, like Pat played with you know, Pat, Paddy O'Shea. Then you had Tomas. But like I, I think historically, Keegan. Like I saw Joe Kernan was doing something with a, a lad who lives here local. Uh, he was, and they were having to pick the best uh, players of the year of the 21st century, right? So you had something like 20 players to pick from. And, and Joe Kernan picked Lee Keegan second, like even though he hasn't the All-Ireland. His scoring rate, unbelievable. And he's the best man marker. And we're talking about Sweeney and Quinlevin. Like Keegan has one of them anyway. Yeah. Keegan will lock down one and it's up to the other fella and the system and, and, and you know, have the likes of Chrissy Barrett there or yeah. whatever. I think ultimately Mayo will just lock them down because I, I think in, in someone like Keegan, they have, a, they, have, they have as much as Sweeney and Quinlevin are marquee, etc. We're talking all-time greats in the likes of, okay. of a Keegan and I, I just think Mayo will, will win by three or Pat, four. Pat, your prediction? First of all, can I say something? That a first for an all Ireland semi-final a preview. Happy Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dublin comfortably and Mayo after a struggle, after a Titanic battle. And Rory? I, I yeah, I think, I, funny enough, I actually think Mayo would, could possibly win quite comfortably. I, 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 I'd see Tipperary coming with fairly similar tactics to what they, what they <clears throat> employed against Cork, which was probably sit 10, 11 back and leave Sweeney Quinlevin up on their own. And they gambled that Cork would be clueless in terms of breaking that down. And they were right. They, they, the gamble paid off correctly. I don't think Mayo will be clueless. I think Mayo are well used to playing against that type of system. They've come up against it many times, and James Warren has come up against it many times in the past. And I think they're better they're at it. I think, and I think they're, they're better at it. And they're better at it. And, and, and Mayo, Mayo won't, won't be as stupid, I, I think. And I think they'll... they'll 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 probably break it down a lot faster. They'll they'll run the ball in bigger numbers. Won't get isolated. Won't get caught in that web. And I actually think Mayo could win, you know, by seven or eight actually in the end. Okay. Well, I riding high on my prediction of Waterford uh, last week. I'm actually going to say oh. Tipperary. You know, wow. I now a, a now something of a sensei at this. So that's it. And uh, Cavan. No, uh, Dublin and Tipperary. <laughs> we'll, see how, we'll see how that shakes out next week. Thank Brilliant. you. To, to Pat, Kieran, and Rory. Obviously, you can follow all of both those games on RT Radio, RT Television, and RT Online. I don't need to tell you that. And we'll be back next week. So we will chat to you then. Goodbye. Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar.